Look at this graph. It shows the world population from the start of Sapiens until just before Egypt. And you can see this massive increase right here. What happened? Farming. Farming kickstarts population, but also modern civilization. Farming was both independently invented in these different places and then spread really quickly. And it transformed society from hunter-gatherers into modern civilization. But wait, why did it happen? Forging was better. You had good food, you were taller, versus farming with the crappy carb diet where everyone became shorter. We went from the Chad Paleolithic hunter-gatherer to the virgin Neolithic farmer. And the same thing happened to plants, where we went from Chad wild plants to weak domesticated plants. Jared Diamond called farming the worst mistake in the history of the human race. So how did it happen? Well, today we're gonna to solve the puzzle for why humans started farming, even if it sucked. And fundamentally, farming won because evolution selects for one thing, the number of offspring. It doesn't care about your diet. And the number of offspring and energy consumption was maximized in this new world where we had warmth, but more importantly, seasonality that enabled farmers and crops to collaborate. There are three parts to this puzzle. First, seasonality. Second, what domestication is from an evolutionary perspective. And then third, why farming specifically won. And if you're new here, hi, I'm Reese, and welcome to How Everything Evolved where we answer history's juiciest questions. And I'm not just gonna answer with AI slop. But yeah, I've done a bunch of research. I've read a bunch of these books. I've talked to tons of experts. I've made these 20,000 note cards because I know how curious you are. And I want my research to match your curiosity. And in fact, I'm curious too. So let's do it. Okay, let's start with number one, seasons. So remember, this is crazy. You know, sapiens start around here. We kind of got language and stuff around here. We kind of conquered the world. We killed all the other homo species. We killed all the megafauna. But then by 10,000 BCE, we had about 5 million people. And then by 3,000 BCE, we had 50 million. So it's a 10x increase from 5 million to 50 million. Why did that happen? And why didn't it happen earlier? Well, remember earlier the world looked like this. We were in an ice age. It was cold. We were killing the woolly mammoths and the megafauna and everything was covered in ice. I mean, look at these, all the ice sheets are coming down in North America, in Europe, you know, all of England was covered by ice. You had the Siberian ice sheet coming down. The Patagonian ice sheet was really big. Plus you had all these land bridges, obviously, to the Americas over here. And then the Persian Gulf was dry. You could get to um, a bunch of places like uh, Tasmania and Australia. And so this isn't great for farming. Well, it got warmer, yay. You can see here is a picture of years before present, you know, 400,000 years, 200,000 years. And then around 20,000 years ago, you know, we had this great transition here, the Holocene thermal maximum, where we came out of the ice ages, the younger dry ascended, and we got into this beautiful time where we could actually do human civilization. But why did it get warmer? Well, you can actually see these pulses of warmth every 100,000 years or so beforehand. So this was just like the latest pulse of warmth. And these pulses of warmth come from something called a Milankovitch cycle. And these are essentially how the earth is moving around the sun and how it's tilted. And it's kind of based around Jupiter in some ways, because Jupiter is kind of messing with us and making us be a little bit different. And so you can see here that there are three big parts of Milankovitch cycles. There's precession, which is kind of like a spinning top. And so the top is spinning and we're kind of wobbling around and that changes uh, seasonality. Then you have obliquity, which is kind of tilt. And so it goes between 22 degrees and 24 degrees. And so it gets like more seasonal or less tilted. And then eccentricity is when you kind of, the oblong nature of our orbit gets either more cylindrical or wider. And so you can kind of get closer to the sun or further away from the sun. And these happen at cycles of 26,000 years, 41,000 years and 100,000 years. And so you can see here that those 100,000 year cycles that were happening before, because eccentricity changes our orbit every 100,000 years, which makes it warmer every 100,000 years. But warmth is only part of the picture. And it's because we know that farming didn't start everywhere. If the whole world got warmer and then only warmth was the thing that made farming happen, we'd expect this whole thing to be green. But instead, we only get farming in some of these specific places, in the Fertile Crescent, in the basins of the Yellow River, over here in America. And so in addition to warmth, other thing that happened was seasonality. And seasonality makes people stay in the same place because if you imagine it's not very seasonal, you can, it's kind of like being in LA or San Francisco or whatever, where weather's the same the whole year round, you can kind of just go wherever, and January's not that different from June. But then if it's super seasonal, then it becomes more like uh, Minnesota or whatever, where the summers are really hot and the winters are really cold. And what that makes you do is it makes you have to prepare for a hard winter. And you also can't just travel to other places. You're like, okay, I guess we gotta hunker down for the winter. And so that started to happen more once we started to get more seasonal. And here's a picture of what some of those early storage behaviors look like. You can see people 
constructing little storage huts and put bring stuff up off the ground and then you know it gets abandoned obviously and then similar here people are making stuff and they are storing things and this storage behavior happens once we have seasons and the creation of seasons plus warmth is shown in this graph where what it shows are these milankovitch cycles and you can see the dark line here is precession plus eccentricity the kind of dash line is axial tilt so how much you're tilted and you can see around 12,000 years ago that's when they were kind of aligned so it was both warm and it was seasonal and it gave us a bunch more insulation a bunch more warmth at 65 degrees north in july giving that kind of northern warmth seasonal weather and all these ideas come together in this graph which essentially proves that seasonality made farming and these are all taken from this great andrea montranga research paper that i'll link below and what this graph shows is where independent agriculture showed up and what it also shows is how pleasant different parts of the world were around 8,000 years ago. So you can see a lot of the world's pleasant, not the super north, of course, but most of the world's pleasant. And then you can also see how seasonal it was in 21,000 years before present, but also how seasonal it was 8,000 years before present. Instead, we see that agriculture started in the places where it was both pleasant, but also seasonal. So all these red places are places where it's like, okay, you have seasons and it's warm. Boom, you're in the Fertile Crescent. Let's start some farming. Boom, you're in the Yellow River Valley in China. Let's start farming. Well, really first, let's settle down and then let's start farming. Okay, now let's move to number two, domestication. And we're going to talk about what it is, how it works, and why it wins. Okay, so we started domesticating plants. It's amazing. What is that? What happens? Well, you have this process where you have a domesticator like humans, or they can be these other animals, and those domesticators actively manage the fitness of the domesticate. And so that can be, you know, crops or livestock or whatever. And the domesticated species provides resources and services back to the domesticator, us. And domestication is amazing. It can take, you know, a wild mustard plant like this one. And if you select for different things, you get all these plants that we know today. So if you select for the terminal buds, you get cabbage, or you can get Brussels sprouts, or if you select for the stem, you get kohlrabi, or if you select for the leaves, you get kale. If you select for the flowers, you get broccoli. And if you select for the flower clusters, you get cauliflower. But these are all the same plant that we've domesticated. You know, way back in the day, we did this with wheat. And so you can see, here's wild wheat. It has to do all these things normally. It has to have competition with neighbors and pest defense and soil treatment and seed distribution, all these things. And you get a kind of weak seed production with the energy left over versus improved wheat. You know, the farmer takes care of the planting and the nutrients and soil treatment and things like that. And you get these really nice seed pods that then you turn into bread and things. Of course, we do the same thing with animals as well. And so... Here's like a wolf, and then here's a cute little dog. You know, you have a ox, and then you have this little cattle. You have like the jungle chicken, and then you have the actual chickens that we, you know, eat for eggs and things. And so we started living in a world that kind of looks like this, with domestic dogs and pigs, and you know, you have your plants here that you're planting, and then you reap what you sow, and you got your cows back there, and we're all hanging out here kind of being sedentary. Well, if that's domestication, why did it win? Well, it won, coming back to this thing, because evolution selects for one thing, the number of offspring. And when you're selecting for number of offspring, what evolution is mostly selecting for are these win-win teams that capture the most solar energy. And so that's us plus plants can capture the most solar energy. And it happened at this time, you know, because warmth and seasonality allowed farmers and crops to collaborate. Evolution is kind of constantly searching for these win-win teams that capture the most energy. And so yeah, it made sense in this situation that evolution selected for this new team, the plants and the humans, AKA the crops and the farmers, that could extract even more energy out of the land. It's roughly 10x more energy per kilometer that you can extract out of the land. And I want to really understand this puzzle of domestication by kind of zooming out and seeing both how we domesticated rocks and how domestication is part of this more general set of processes that evolution's doing. So here's this picture of all these stone tools that we started to make as Homo erectus, Homo habilis. So we had these new smart creatures that started to be able to use the things around them. And these new Homo creatures, these new hominids were able to align the kind of physical world with the cultural world to create these tools and then to use these tools to extract more energy. It's another team that extracts more energy from the system. But in this case, it's us collaborating with the earth instead 
instead of with other species. And that collaboration then put pressure on our hands so that then there was a new alignment of our genetics in to say, okay, we're gonna have these hands that are really good at dealing with tools. So it was an alignment of those genetics with the physical world with all these tools that we were making. And that also pushed our genetics to have this bigger brain size. And so in this situation, instead of domesticating rocks and domesticating our own genes, we're starting to domesticate other species. And that happens essentially because you have this new kind of biological market that's emerging where you have a bunch of plants on one side, they're kind of offering up and they're saying, hey, I'm gonna be this plant, I'm gonna be this plant. And mostly they're optimizing for their own reproduction, but occasionally they do things that kind of say, hey, do you wanna make me a crop? Do you wanna make me a crop? And on the other side, you also have this market of humans. The humans are there. They're kind of being like, oh, I can be a human and I can eat stuff normally, you know, hunt and gather, or I can start to farm I can see what you're offering on this other side and I can start to engage with you and start to say, let's actually be a farmer and a crop. And that tit for tat relationship emerges because you have these two replicators. You have crops on one side and the humans on the other side that are kind of repeatedly meeting each other in the evolutionary game and eventually cooperation emerges. And Richard Dawkins talks a lot about cooperation in his book, The Selfish Gene. He actually wanted to call it the cooperative gene or something like that, but ended up calling it the selfish gene. And here's a great line from that book. He says, selection favors those genes which succeed in the presence of other genes, which in turn succeed in the presence of them. And so he's talking about at the genetic level where you have these genes that are being kind of cooperative with each other. But you can also think about this for domestication where you say, oh, selection favors those people which succeed in the presence of other crops which in turn succeed in the presence of them. And so you have these farmers and these crops on either side of this thing, which are starting to succeed in the presence of each other. Robert Axelrod talks about this in his book, The Evolution of Cooperation. And he wrote that book kind of in a response to the Cold War, where we were in this prisoner's dilemma or in this arms race. And it was like, wait a second, is there a way that we can kind of evolve cooperation in these systems? And he did it by showing these computer programs that were playing against each other in this iterated prisoner's dilemma. And what he found is that in those games, something like tit for tat would emerge, where if you um, defected on me, I would defect on you. But if you were actually nice to me, then I'd be nice to you. But that process only emerges when the time length is long. If I only see you once, I might immediately steal from you. But if you and I are gonna meet each other over and over and over again, then we're gonna have to start collaborating. And so he calls this the shadow of the future. And this thing says, the shadow of the future, how repeated games make global cooperation possible. And that's roughly the idea here where the shadow of the future is really long for this lineage of plants and the shadow of the future is really long for this lineage of humans. And so as they start to meet each other over and over again in this biological and energetic market, they start to collaborate and co-domesticate each other. Evolution selects for these win-win teams because evolution is a tinkerer. And this is this great quote from Francois Jacob, or, or maybe Francis Jacob. And he's saying that evolution is not an engineer. It doesn't invent new things that well, but what it does do is it takes what's lying around already. And so for humans, it was like, okay, you got these hands that I guess are here because you started to stand up. Well, I guess let's use these hands or something. Let's uh, use them to make these rocks better or whatever. And biologically, evolution was also a tinkerer at the chemical evolution level, where it was kind of selecting for stable sets of molecules. And it was just like, okay, I got all these molecules around. Let's just keep on shoving them together and see what emerges. And then much later with genes, there's like genetic duplication and things like that, where evolution is just kind of duplicating genes and kind of seeing what emerges and tinkering with what's already around. And so at this time, evolution's tinkering. It's tinkering with, you know, these kind of plants on one side and it's tinkering with these kind of humans on the other side saying, okay, you're just gonna, there's gonna be these things that are already stable. There's a survival of the stable happening. These things are already successful and now they're just gonna co-tinker with each other and maybe this new win-win team will emerge that can access more energy. This idea that evolution is a tinkerer was talked about really well in a few books. One was The Blind Watchmaker by Richard Dawkins, maybe 1985. And then the second one is actually the earlier book, the better book, which is called The Sciences of the Artificial by Herbert Simon from like 1970. And in those books, they talk about this watchmaker and the idea of a watchmaker came from this guy, William Paley in I think 1800. And he said, hey, you got this thing, a watch, you know, watches are crazy. A watch, obviously, you know, all these interlocking parts didn't just come together by chance. They were obviously put together by a designer for a specific purpose to help people tell the time. And so what Paley's saying here is that, yeah, if you look at things with design, whether it's a watch or it's my cat, it's like, oh my God, my cat, that obviously didn't just come together by chance. 
It was obviously put together by some kind of intelligent designer. But actually, that's wrong because the watchmaker is actually a blind watchmaker. That's what evolution is. It is this tinkerer. And you think about something like a watch. A watch didn't come together by chance, but it kind of did. And why? Well, it's because all of these different subparts of the watch were already around. And this blind watchmaker idea is also shown by this great law called Gall's Law, which states that a complex system that works is invariably found to have evolved from a simple system that worked. Great things start simple, like learning to crawl before you walk and then run. And it shows like, hey, you don't make a car by only making the wheels first and all this stuff. It's like, no, you make things that are kind of car-like and then eventually you get something like a car. And Gall's law is normally talked about with kind of agile and lean development or like technology, where you say, hey, if you're trying to build a complex system, start with an MVP, start with something that works and then kind of build accrete layers on top of that system. But it also works for evolution. This is the same thing as evolution as a tinkerer, which is that a complex system that works, a watch or a cat or domestication, invariably evolved from a simple system that worked. That simple system was all of these things that existed before the watch that were proto watch or all the little proto cat things. Or at domestication, you had all these stable forms that were meeting each other over and over again, which gave evolution as a tinker and gave Gall's law the time to start creating a more complex system, domestication from a simple system, sedentism and storage behavior. Okay, now let's talk about number three, which is why farming actually won. So part of the reason why farming won is because the hunter gatherer life was a good one, but it started to be done, you know? So this is this graph of when homo sapiens came to different continents and the population of large mammals on that continent. You can see at each continent, we kind of came in and we killed all the animals there. And it's kind of like the fossil fuels essentially, where it's like, okay, if you use it all up, there's no more woolly mammoths left. They're not like reproducing a bunch. In addition to the existing energy source going away, this new energy source, farming and domesticated plants and animals was, you know, being amazing. And so what farming does is it creates more density per land area. And so you can see here's a graph that shows, I think this was for Europe, it shows the density of people over time. And you can see it went up roughly 5x or 10x over the course of a few thousand years. And so that's why even if you're some kind of Chad Paleolithic hunter gatherer, you might be stronger, you might be taller or whatever. There's like one of you and then there's 10x of these freaking farmers. And so it kind of, it doesn't matter what battle you're doing. They're getting tons more energy out of the land and they're producing tons more kids per population. Hunter gatherer moms have kids every four years while farmers have them every two years. And so what that meant is, yeah, farmers then started to take over like a big old virus. So you can see this graph here. This is just Europe, but this is happening all around the world and shows that, you know, 10,000 BCE, we started farming in the Fertile Crescent and then it started to spread. It spread, 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 spread until the whole world was mostly covered in farms. You can see that here with this graph of today, which is like, you know, we started farming, you know, 10,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago. But what this shows is that the whole world now does this new thing. This is all the pasture land where we have domesticated animals and we give them food and then cropland is in green and pretty much the whole world except for the deserts and the forests up north are covered in crops now. Okay, so that's why farming started and why it won. Farming won because evolution selects for one thing, the number of offspring. And it won because evolution selects for these win-win teams that capture the most solar energy. And at this time, farming won because warmth and seasonality allowed these farmers and crops to collaborate. Thank you as always for listening. If you have any feedback or questions or thoughts, please put them in the comments down below. If you wanna understand how Homo sapiens came to be before farming, check out this video here, or if you want to understand what happened after farming, which is mostly how Eurasia just completely won the world, then subscribe here for more. Thanks and bye.